What's up, Ozone? So welcome to the Ozone, and welcome to Haps. <laughs> welcome. Uh, this is going to be a audiobook read through kind of thing. Uh, I have read these stories before, um, but today we're going to get started with Help Wanted. I'm super excited because this is my favourite story of all time. I mean, I've never read it, but uh, I know the leaks, so. This is such a good story. You're going to have such a great time with this entire book, really. It is a blast. So, I think we should get straight into it. Why is the men's room always such a nightmare? Steve sprayed the toilet and walls with disinfectant. It was weird. The women's room never needed anything but a basic mop, wipe down, and replenishing of soap and toilet paper. But when taking care of the men's room, he always felt like he might as well be cleaning the monkey house at the zoo. Steve never thought he'd be scrubbing toilets at gas station for minimum wage. With his digital art and design skills, he always figured he'd be working for one of the many tech companies in his booming city, preferably designing video games. He had a billion ideas, many of them better than games that were already on the market, if he did say so himself. Yet here he was, with a toilet brush in one hand, and a bottle of spray cleaner in the other. For the past several years, he had applied for any position at a tech company that he was remotely qualified for, but the competition was fierce. He was up against all these kids with expensive Ivy League degrees, who had already done internships or had jobs at the most prestigious companies in the country. Steve had graduated from a local public college, paying for his tuition by working long hours at crappy jobs, and once he earned his degree, he was never hired for anything but more crappy jobs. He made his way to the second stool in the men's room. In this case, the term crappy job was literal. Steve's tiny studio apartment was one floor above a takeout place named Capernerni's Fish Boat. The greasy odour wafted upward so that the carpet, furniture and bedding in the apartment always smelled of fried fish. Even Steve's clothes hanging in the closet had absorbed the smell. Sometimes stray cats followed him on the street, breathing in his fishy aroma. As soon as Steve got home from work, a shower was absolutely essential. Sometimes he felt like he should spray himself with the disinfectant he used to clean the gas station restrooms. By the time he showered and changed into clean, comfortable, if slightly fishy smelling clothes, he was ready to eat something and get to his real work. He popped a frozen burrito in the microwave, grabbed a soda from the fridge, and sat down at the computer. The project he was working on, Chip Off the Old Block, was a family-friendly fetch quest-based game featuring cartoony chipmunks. He was about halfway through the design and he hoped that a company would be interested in it, but if they weren't, maybe he'd try to just bring it out himself. He was tired of cleaning toilets and waiting for something to happen, which reminded him he should message Amanda before it was past her bedtime. Recently, Steve's tiredness of waiting for something to happen had led him to join a dating app. He had always dreamed of marrying a smart, kind, beautiful woman. They would live in a comfortable house and have two adorable kids, a boy and a girl. But dreams were one thing, reality was another. Strangely, one didn't meet many attractive women cleaning toilets and mopping floors at a gas station convenience store. Occasionally, an interesting woman would come into the store to pay for gas or grab a gallon of milk, but it was hard to be suave, eh? or suave with a mop in your hand. For a while, he didn't think he was going to meet anyone through the app, either, but then he had seen Amanda's profile and sent her a cautious message that only said hi. She said hi back, almost immediately. After that, they progressed to an actual conversation. Well, as close to an actual conversation as texting could be. Steve had been drawn to Amanda's profile pic not just because she was traditionally beautiful, but because she seemed to radiate kindness. She had shoulder-length brown hair and a winning smile. She was a preschool teacher, and Steve figured she was a good one because of her kindness, patience, and sense of humour. The weird thing about their relationship was that even though they had been chatting for over a month, they had gotten out on only two real dates. Steve worked at the gas station from 3pm until 10pm, and Amanda worked at the preschool from 7am until 3.30pm. They couldn't have found more incompatible schedules if they had tried. Steve grabbed his phone and texted her, I hope you had a good day. 
She texted back, A kid threw up on my shoes first thing this morning, but at least that my day had to get better from there. Lol. Steve chuckled. He guessed they both had to deal with more than their fair share of grossness at their jobs. He typed, Lol. If things went down here from here, it would be pretty bad. I'll let you get some rest. Good night. She texted, Night night, with a sleepy face emoji. Steve smiled, set aside his phone, and settled back into work on his game until he was too tired to stay awake anymore. As soon as Steve opened the door of the convenience store, his manager, a humorous, middle-aged man with the unfortunate name of Gilbert Hurlbut, <laughs> looked up from his phone and said, Some kid spilled about a gallon of blue slushy over by the back left cooler. Go mop it up. No problem, Steve said. Which was what he always said to Mr. Hurlbut. It was the path of least resistance. He went to the janitorial closet and set the mop bucket under the faucet in the utility sink. Would it have killed Mr. Hurlbut to say hello before he started baking, uh, barking orders? Steve poured some cleaning solution into the filing, into the filling bucket, sorry, and thought, not for the first time, about the bizarreness of Mr. Hurlbut's name. Mr. Hurlbut's parents, presumably Mr. Hurlbut Sr. and Mr. Hurlbut, or Mrs. Hurlbut, knew that they were having a child who would be saddled with their ridiculous last name. So why not give the kid a normal name, like Matthew or David or something, instead of saddling with him with an equally unwieldy first name? Of course, that being said, Mr. Hurlbut could choose to go by Gil or Bert, but instead the name Gilbert was stretched right over the breast pocket of his uniform shirt. Steve's wandering thoughts resulted in the mop bucket overflowing. He tilted it and poured some out of the excess water, and then carried the bucket and mop to the back of the store to clean up the sticky mess. Steve's hands were mopping, but his mind was on the on his game and what he would work on as soon as he got home from this meaningless job. I said, can you spare me a moment? Steve hadn't, had been so preoccupied he hadn't even noticed that a man was standing right next to him trying to get his attention. The man in question did not resemble the customers they usually got in the store, exhausted, inexpensively dressed people coming from or going to night shift jobs. Even though Steve didn't know much about clothes, he could tell this man's dark suit was expensive. It was spotless and wrinkle-free, and seemed to have been tailored to the contours of his body. I'm sorry, can I help you? Steve said. I think perhaps you can, the man said. He had a strong, uh, he had strong chiselled features, and a haircut that looked as expensive as his suit. That is, if you're Steve Snodgrass. I am, Steve said pointing to his name tag and immediately feeling like an idiot. Could you step outside with me for a moment? The man said. This situation was getting stranger and stranger. Steve had thought the man just needed help locating an item in the store, but now it appeared that this guy wanted something from him personally. Steve felt nervous. Was the guy a cop? A serial killer? I don't know about that, sir, Steve said. I just started my shift, so I'm not due for a break yet. I don't want to get in trouble with my boss. Well, if you step outside of me, you may find yourself working for another boss. And for a great deal more money. He smiled. His teeth were perfect. Steve was growing more confused by the moment. Was this man in the mafia? I'm afraid I don't understand. Perhaps this will help. The man said, handing Steve a business card. Steve looked down at the card and read, Brock Edwards, Talent Acquisition... Fazbear Entertainment. It took a few seconds for the name Fazbear to ring a bell, but then Steve remembered the kids' pizza places that had once been widely popular, but had suffered a downfall after a, vari after a variety of criminal allegations. There had been a talk of murders, though Steve didn't remember how many. There was weirder stuff too, stories about paranormal events and that kind of nonsense. Fazbear frights. <laughs> Uh, Steve was still puzzled, but he had to admit he was curious too. Maybe I could step outside for just one minute, he said. Very good, Mr. Snodgrass, Mr. Edwards said, following Steve out the back door. They stood out back near the dumpster. The fumes of garbage hung in the air. You are familiar with Fazbear Entertainment, Mr. Edwards said. Kind of, Steve said. I mean, I went to the pizza place a couple of times as a kid, birthday parties and that kind of thing. And also, I know a little about the 
scandals. Unfortunately, that's what a lot of people know about Fazbear Entertainment, Mr. Edwards said. Over the past few years, there have been a number of individuals determined to smear our company's reputation by spreading terrible rumours. And of course, the public dines on that kind of filth. He straightened his already straight tie. And so, as a result, Fazbear Entertainment is in need of some rebranding. Okay, but I still don't know what this has to do with me. Mr. Edwards looked Steve up and down. You are a game designer, are you not? An aspiring one, I guess you could say. How did this guy know he made games? You sell yourself short, Mr. Snodgrass. <laughs> You've posted two games online and they were quite good. Thanks, Steve said. Though he still wasn't sure how this guy had found out about his games. He wondered what else Brock Edwards knew about him. And so here's where you come in, Mr. Edwards said. In an effort to laugh of... Uh, uh, yeah, sorry... In an effort to laugh off our detractors, Fuzzbur Entertainment wants to put out a line of video games based on the lies that have been spread about the company. Horror games. You mean like horror games based on what people say happened in the old pizza places? Steve said. The idea seemed distasteful at best, cruel at worst. Yes, Mr. Edwards said. They should be scary, but at the same time... They should poke fun at the ridiculousness of all those libious rumours and accusations. He put on a smile that looked calculated. We'd like you to develop a series of four games for us, Mr. Snodgrass. I think you'd find the compensation much more generous than what you're currently being paid for. Uh, mopping. A job offering game development. It was what Steve had dreamed of his entire life. So why did it feel so weird and wrong? We'd want you to start right away, of course. We could fly you to a remote location where you'd have everything you'd need to work on the game. Plus everything you'd need to live comfortably. A spacious condone, con condominium, sorry. A personal chef. Staff to run your errands and do your laundry. A home gym, if you, let us, if you choose to use it. He looked disdainfully at <laughs> Steve's gym-free physique. We could give you until Friday to tie up any loose ends. It's an incredible opportunity, Mr. Snodgrass. What do you say? Horror games, huh? Steve said, stalling. If they were horror games based on ghosts and goblins or other purely fictional creatures, he wouldn't have a problem with them. But horror games based on what he had understood to be real murders made him feel queasy. Fazbear Entertainment said the murders weren't real, but they would say that, wouldn't they? That's right. Mr. Edwards said. They'd need to be based in the Fazbear Entertainment universe, but you'd have a lot of creative freedom within those bounds. But I couldn't work on them here. There was something troubling about this whole situation that he couldn't quite put his finger on. No, the company was very specific about that. They don't want any chance of leaks. Leaving town for a long period of time was another sticking point. It was hard enough to see Amanda given their differing work schedules. They hadn't gotten close enough yet to make a long-distance relationship work. He was starting to think he really liked her. If he took a chance with Fazbear Entertainment, a company with a dicey reputation at best, was it worth the risk of losing his chance with Amanda? I truly appreciate the offer, Mr. Edwards, but I just don't feel right about taking this job. The world's a scary enough place without adding more horror to it. I really want to concentrate on making family-friendly games. He had made... he had his personal reasons for saying no as well, but this was probably the biggest one. Didn't kids already have enough to be scared of in today's world? Mr. Edwards laughed for a longer time than was comfortable. Do you mean to tell me that you're going to walk away from this opportunity, go back inside that store, and pick up that mop? Yes, I do, Steve said, but thank you for your offer. He wasn't looking forward to going back inside, getting yelled at by Mr. Hurlbutt, and cleaning floors and the toilets but somehow he still felt strangely good about his decision. Oh my gosh, that is such an amazing introductory section. I absolutely love the beginning to this story. Um, Steve's the rogue indie developer, right? He, or he was like set up to be at least. It's pretty cool, pretty cool. Let me just have a sip of water. That's something I'm gonna be doing more. Um, 
throughout these audiobooks is having more water because I my throat dries up very quickly these days. Uh, anyway, still in his pyjamas, Steve padded barefoot in the kitchen to start a pot of coffee. A little something to eat and some major caffeine and he'd be ready to settle in and work on chip off the old block for a few hours until it was time to head to the gas up. He popped some bread into the toaster and grabbed a couple eggs from the fridge. His phone pinged. Thinking it might be Amanda, he picked it up. Someone had messaged him on the dating app. Strange. It definitely wasn't Amanda because she would have just sent him a regular text. Curiosity got the better of him. He opened the app and saw... A message from Victoria. Who the heck was Victoria? He opened the message and read, Hi, would you like to chat sometime? <laughs> I don't know why that was the don't know why that was the voice I gave her. I was trying to do a female voice, but it, it didn't go very well. He clicked on her picture to enlarge it. When he saw it, he gasped. If someone had asked him to describe what his physical ideal of a woman would be, his description would exactly match the photo he was looking at. Victoria had long, wavy black hair with a beautiful sheen that caught the light. She had big, doe-like brown eyes and a sun-kissed complexion. Her cheekbones were high and her lips were full. She wore just enough makeup to accentuate her natural beauty. And of course, he reminded himself, People were notoriously dishonest on the internet. This could be a random photo that someone much less physically attractive had found to pass off as their own, or it could be a photo of the actual woman from 20 years ago. But if it wasn't, what if this vision of loveliness was real, and had decided for whatever reason that she was interested in him? Wait, he told himself, what about Amanda? Amanda was a nice, caring person, and there seemed to be a real connection between them, but then again... They were in such an early stage of their relationship that he wasn't even sure it could be called a relationship yet. And they hadn't said they were exclusive. <laughs> oh my gosh. Amanda could be dating half a, dozen half a dozen guys for all he knew. He hit reply to Victoria's message and typed one word. Sure. As soon as he tapped send, Steve smelled something burning. It was like for a few minutes there he had entirely lost track of where he was and what he was doing. Home, kitchen, breakfast, he reminded himself. He looked at the counter and saw black smoke rolling from the toaster. After he threw, threw away the burnt toast, opened a window to let the smoke out and poured himself a cup of coffee, Steve sat down at the computer to work on the game. The mysterious message from Victoria, whoever she might be, had left him too keyed up to feel like eating anything. His phone pinged again. Hi, it's me. I'm glad you said you'd like to chat. Is now a good time? Sure, Steve typed. Any time's a good time. As soon as the world, uh, sorry, as soon as the words appeared on the screen, Steve did a facepalm. So much for not sounding too eager. I've never used a dating app before. I'm really more of a face-to-face -face person. Maybe you would like to meet sometime soon. Maybe this weekend. Sure. You could come to my house if you want. It's out in the country. It's really quiet. We'd have plenty of privacy to talk and to get to know each other. Are you sure you want me to come to your house for our first meeting? Shouldn't we meet in a public place first in case I'm a creep or something? <laughs> Lol, I trust you. How about Saturday at noon? I'll make us lunch. Sounds great. As soon as they finished chatting, Steve remembered he had plans with Amanda for Saturday. She was an understanding person, though. She'd be okay with rescheduling. He texted her. So sorry, but something came up. Can't do Saturday. Almost immediately, she texted back. Disappointed, but okay, with a sad emoji. Steve felt guilty, but he told himself he'd make it up to her. Matt, still dressed in the uniform of the computer store he managed, dunked a donut in his coffee. In the flesh! No! <laughs> But I thought things were going good with Amanda, he said. They are. Steve had called Matt, asking if, they could, if he could meet him at the all-night donut shop after work. His life was getting way too eventful all of a sudden, and Matt, his best friend since freshman year of college, was the only person he felt like he could talk to about it. Matt was unfailingly honest and had never hesitated to tell Steve when he was making a horrible mistake. Matt also seemed to have the infuriating habit of always being right. But this message, Steve said, it came out of nowhere. And this woman, 
Suddenly, he was at a loss for words. This woman said she'd send goons to beat the crap out of you if you didn't go out with her? Steve laughed. <laughs> no. This woman said if you didn't go out with her, she'd make all your darkest secrets a matter of public record? No, Steve said, still laughing. But to be fair, my life to date has been too boring to accumulate many dark secrets. He took a deep breath and tried to find the words to, to explain himself. This woman, he picked up his phone. Here, let me show you. He picked up the dating app, found Victoria's picture and showed it to Matt. Matt's jaw dropped and so did his donut. Whoa, he said. I get it. I totally get it. Steve handed him another donut. He was relieved that Matt understood. Even though he was beginning to doubt his GPS, Steve turned off a narrow, winding country road onto another narrow, winding country road. It was beautiful out here with rolling hills and trees and the occasional pasture full of cows, but Steve couldn't imagine living somewhere so remote. He also couldn't imagine that a woman as beautiful and glamorous as Victoria would want to live in such a rural area. Surely someone so lovely and charming would want to live where she, sh where she could see and be seen. Turn left on Brushy Pine Road, the GPS ordered. Your destination will be on your left. The destination seemed to be a long gravel driveway that led into a densely wooded area. Steve drove doubtfully, but the GPS had never steered him wrong before. Finally, the driveway ended at a house. It was small and modest, a neat little white cottage with green shutters and a green front door. It looked more like a home for someone's grandmother than for an attractive young single woman. He parked, grabbed the bouquet of grocery store flowers he had selected for her, and walked up to knock on the door. No one answered, Steve sighed. Had this been some kind of trick? He tried the door, and was surprised to find it unlocked. Hello? Anybody home? He called. When there was no response, he stepped inside. He wouldn't normally have entered someone's house without permission, but he reasoned that he had been invited and that was good enough. Steve was surprised to find himself standing in an empty room. The white walls were blank, the windows were curtainless, and there was not a single piece of furniture in sight. He wondered if he had made some kind of mistake. Was she meeting him as a real estate agent trying to sell him a house instead of as a date? The house may have been empty, but it was not silent. There was a soft but steady mechanical whirring sound. And then, so suddenly that it made Steve jump, a loud, high-pitched ringing that hurt his ears, his brain. What was going on in this bizarre place? He felt suddenly unsteady on his feet and propped himself up against the wall to regain his balance. Steve! The horrible ringing stopped and was replaced by a voice like velvet. Oh, sorry, I can't do a voice like velvet, but I'm going I'm, I'm to try. I'm so sorry, I must not have heard the door. Her looks did not disappoint. She was just like the picture online, except better, because she was standing there right in front of him. She was wearing a form-fitting green dress, which complemented the flecks of green in her brown eyes. Her figure was fit and toned, as if she worked out regularly, but was also curvy in the right places. Curvy in the smile, ha <laughs> ching <laughs> Steve was instantly besotted. Hi, he said, wishing he had planned some kind of clever opening line. Since he hadn't, he shoved the bouquet at her instead. She received the flowers and smiled, all lovely lips and straight white teeth. How beautiful, and thoughtful too. Thank you. She looked around the room, as if trying to imagine it from his point of view. I know I haven't done much with the place yet, but with the right touches, I think it'll be really cosy. And for our lunch, I thought we could have a sort of a picnic on the floor. We can put down a blanket... And I have bread and cheese and fruit and some good chocolate. That sounds nice. Before Steve could say anything else, there was another horrible, high-pitched electronic scream. He looked up in the direction of the sound and saw the red light flashing on the smoke alarm. Beep, beep, beep! It was strange. He could neither see nor smell smoke. He reached up to try to disable it, but lost his footing as the room began to spin faster and faster like an out-of-control merry-go-round. Steve opened his eyes. He was lying on a couch. But where? The layout of the small room was familiar. 
but when he had seen it before, it had been empty. Now there was the chocolate brown couch he was lying on, and a matching armchair. There was a coffee table stacked with both fashion magazines and tech-themed magazines, and a large cabinet with a flat-screen TV and a few different kinds of video game consoles. The walls that had been blank before were now hung with photos of Victoria. Victoria hiking in the mountains, her lustrous hair windblown and beautiful. Victoria tanned and toned and gorgeous in an emerald green two-piece swimsuit, lounging on the beach. Victoria eating an ice cream cone on a park bench, looking adorable with a dab of ice cream on her perfect nose. Victoria herself came padding barefoot into the room, wearing jeans and a black fitted t-shirt. Hadn't she be hadn't eh, hadn't she been wearing a dress earlier? Then again, the room had been empty earlier too. Steve was hopelessly confused and disoriented. Hey babe, Victoria said. You had a bad dizzy spell and kind of passed out on the couch. I brought you a glass of water. Why don't you try to sit up and drink a little? Steve had never had a dizzy spell before. But now that he thought about it, he had been too nervous about the date to eat breakfast this morning. He sat up slowly. You know, I think I'm. I think maybe I need to eat something. He accepted the water glass and was surprised to find himself drinking it down in a few gulps. Were we going to have a picnic on the floor? Now Victoria looked confused. A picnic on the floor? You mean like on our first date? Our first date? But isn't this? Steve looked around the furnished room. I'm sorry, I am really confused. Victoria sat down next to him and took his hand. Confused or not, Steve loved having her close to him, touching him. It happens, honey, it happens, she said, squeezing his hand. Sometimes you forget things. You have memory loss as a result of that car accident you had a few years ago. I don't remember a car accident, Steve said. He was a very careful driver. Exactly. Victoria squeezed his knee. You took a bad hit on the head. Brain injury. Most of the time you're fine, but sometimes your memory just wipes temporarily, and then it's like you reset, and you're all good again. This was upsetting news. He wondered how many times Victoria had to tell it to him. But I always reset so I remember things again. Victoria smiled. Always. Steve nodded. The explanation was weird, but it also made sense. His sense of time was off. That explained everything. So, you and I... We're together? Victoria laughed. We are very, very together. Wait. She got up from the couch, grabbed one of the framed pictures off the wall, and handed it to him. The photo was taken outdoors under an arch of flowers. Victoria stood smiling in a lacy white gown and veil, holding a bouquet of flowers that matched the ones decorating the arch. Steve was standing beside her in a tux, but the main thing he was wearing was an impossibly big smile. No wonder, Steve thought. His wedding day had to have been the happiest day of his life. Too bad he had no memory of it whatsoever. You are so beautiful, he said. It was a beautiful dress, Victoria said. Not just in the picture, Steve said. Always. You're always so beautiful. Ah, oh, you're too sweet to me, Victoria said. She leaned forward and pressed her lips to his. It was wonderful. It felt like their first kiss. <laughs> Sorry, that was a very weird reaction. That's just a funny line to me. The first kiss, because technically it's the first kiss we see. And we don't know if it is their first kiss or not, but we'll see. Daddy, wake up! It's time for pancakes! Steve opened his eyes. Two children were standing beside the bed. They were wearing pyjamas with some kind of cartoon characters on them, and jumping up and down and yelling, PANCAKES! PANCAKES! The girl looked to be around four, and the boy around two. Both of them had thick black hair and big brown, green fleckled eyes. Fleckled? Flecked eyes. They were beautiful children. The girl and boy he had always wanted, but he had no memory of pregnancies, of births, of infancies or childhoods before this moment. He didn't even know the kids' names. Were they his? Pancakes, huh? He said, sitting himself up in the bed and trying to vein and orient himself. 
The walls, he noticed, were covered with photos of the children from babyhood until now. Steve was even in some of the pictures with them. Today is Saturday, and on Saturday, Mummy always... Sorry, this is not Steve, this is the little girl. Today is Saturday, and on Saturday, Mummy always makes pancakes, the little girl said like she was lecturing him. Okay, sounds good, Steve said, standing up. Lead the way. The little girl took one of his hands, and the little boy took the other. It was a sweet, unfamiliar feeling, those tiny hands gripping his. Victoria was in the kitchen, looking beautiful even in her pink bathrobe with no makeup and her hair unstyled. She was standing over a skillet, expertly p flipping pancakes. All hail the pancake queen, Steve said, kissing her on the cheek. Pancake wench is more like it, she said, laughing. I always forget what a long process this is until I'm actually doing it. Well, we appreciate it, don't we kids, Steve said. He guessed he'd just call them kids until he got a clue about what their names were. Thank you, Mummy, the kids said, hugging her. You're very welcome, she said. Now, Abigail and Avery, if you take your seat at the table, I'll have your pancakes ready in a minute. She turned to Steve. And honey, the coffee's ready if you'd like to get us some. Sure, Steve said. Though his hand, uh, he was repeating... Uh, sorry, though in his head he was repeating, Abigail and Avery, Abigail and Avery. He didn't know where the coffee cups were, and he opened the wrong cabinet at first, but got it right on the second try. He poured them each a cup. Victoria said, Just a splash of milk in the mine, remember? He didn't remember, but he said, Of course, and got the milk out of the fridge. It was a happy breakfast. The pancakes themselves were terrific, and the bacon was crispy the way he liked it. But the best part was sitting around the table as a family, the kids talking and laughing, he and Victoria sharing private smiles. This was what he had always wanted. Did it matter that he hadn't remembered how he had gotten it? Maybe it didn't. People were always saying to live in the moment, and that's what Steve was doing. You couldn't get hung up on your past if you couldn't remember it. So, are you still planning on fixing the leaky faucet in the bathroom today? Victoria asked. Steve didn't remember that this was the plan. But he had learned about his about plumbing from his dad, so he was happy to comply. I'll certainly give it a shot, he said. A few minutes later, when Steve came back into the living room after fixing the faucet, Victoria was sitting on the couch in the living room, looking distressed. We need to talk, she said. Memory problems aside, Steve still knew that that particular sentence never meant good news. Okay, he said, sitting down beside her. She picked up an envelope from the coffee table. This was in the mail today. She handed it to him. He took out the letter and read the words, Notice of Foreclosure. Wait, what? Is our house being foreclosed on? Apparently so, Victoria said. We've been underwater financially for a while. I really wanted to stay at home with the kids until they started kindergarten, but if I have to, I guess I'll go back to work. Let's not be hasty, Steve said. He knew he was going to feel like an idiot saying what he was going to say next, but he had to ask the question, Do I have a job? Sure, Victoria said. You work at the gas up. Oh, he said. He guessed he hadn't forgotten how to clean toilets. But even with you working overtime, the pay there doesn't keep up with the cost of living, especially since the kids came along, Victoria said. Well, I'm just going to have to find a better paying job then. Victoria gave him a brave smile. It would be wonderful if you could. Here comes the tickle monster! Steve stretched out his arms and wiggled his fingers. Abigail and Avery ran through the living room giggling. Chase me, Daddy! Chase me! Oh, God. I said that so loud in my house. And that is so sus. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, he couldn't get over the small burst of happiness he felt every time one of the kids called him Daddy. He heard it before he saw it. That was how it was with their long gravel driveway. If someone was approaching, you always heard the sound of the wheels on the gravel a few seconds before you saw the car. He saw, looking out the window, that in this case, the car was shiny, black, and expensive looking. Unless he had forgotten, which was extremely likely given his memory problems, they weren't expecting anyone. He wondered who, if 
sorry, he wondered if it might be someone who wanted to talk to him about the foreclosure, who might want him to sign some papers making him thus, making the loss of his family's home official. Steve braced himself for the worst. Kids, he said, you should go get washed up. Dinner's soon. Your mum's making spaghetti and meatballs. Pespeket Oh my god. I can't say spaghetti wrong. Pespeket and meatballs. Uh, Abigail sang. That wasn't really singing, but... Pespeket and meatballs. <laughs> Abigail sang, taking her brother by the hand. I like meatballs, Avery said. They hurried off to wash their hands, leaving Steve to meet his fate. Steve stepped out onto the porch. His black car came to a stop. A moment later, a man stepped out of it. It was strange. Steve had forgotten so much, and yet he still remembered this much. The styled hair, the perfect suit. Steve even remembered exactly what it had said on his fancy business card. Brock Edwards, talent acquisition, Fazbear Entertainment. The man smiled as he approached. His teeth were dazzling. Mr. Snodgrass, he said. We've met before. Brock Edwards, Fazbear Entertainment, Steve said, holding out his hand to shake. You have a good memory, Mr. Edwards said, taking Steve's offered hand. For some things, Steve said. Would you like to sit on the porch? We could go inside, but I've got a four-year-old and a two-year-old, so I can't guarantee much quiet. The porch is perfect, Mr. Edwards said. Once they were settled in the porch's two rocking chairs, Steve asked, Can I get you anything to drink? Iced tea? Lemonade? No, thank you, Mr. Edwards said. Steve, since your memory is so good, I'm sure you remember the offer I made you the last time we met. Strangely, Steve could remember every detail. The horror games based on the myths surrounding Fazbear Entertainment. Now facing foreclosure, the idea of the games didn't seem quite so objectionable. I do, he said. Mr. Edwards nodded. Well, here at Fazbear Entertainment... Uh, sorry, well, we here at Fazbear Entertainment want to know that the offer still stands. Can I stay here with my family to work on them? He remembered that last time the offer had involved relocating to an undisclosed area. Yes, Mr. Edwards said. We want you to work wherever and however you're most comfortable. Steve's face broke out in a grin. Their house was saved. He didn't hesitate. I'll take it, he said. <laughs> That night in bed, Victoria laid her head on his shoulder. I can't believe you saved us, she said. Fazbear Entertainment saved us, Steve said, though he had to admit her words made him feel good. Well, if you didn't have the talent and skills that Fazbear Entertainment wanted, then we wouldn't have been saved. Therefore, you saved us. She planted a kiss on his cheek. You're my hero. Ah, oh, shucks, Steve said. But he had to admit he did feel pleased with himself. They held each other close, and Steve fell into a deep sleep. It was coming from the living room. A stomping, rumbling sound. A robber? The house was so far out in the country, Steve was shocked that someone could find it to rob. He got out of bed and put his phone in the pocket of his robe, prepared to call the police. But wait, when, he had, last used, when had he last used his phone? All he could remember was that the last time he tried, it hadn't worked at all. He was going to have to take matters into his own hands. He was scared, but he had to protect his family. Family? Family. He grabbed the softball bat that was in the closet and marched to the living room as though confident instead of terrified. Abigail was standing in front of the coffee table and bumping into it repeatedly. Her eyes were blank and staring, seemingly at nothing. Sweetie, are you okay? Steve asked, trying not to sound panicked. She turned to face him and smiled. Oh, hi, Daddy. Sweetheart, it's the middle of the night. You should go back to bed. Okay, Daddy. She shuffled down the hall and disappeared into her room. The door to Avery's room was slightly ajar, which was the natural state of all of the interior doors in the house. For some reason, none of them would fully close, let alone lock. Just to make sure his son was okay, Steve peeked into his room. Avery was asleep, safe and sound, sprawled out with one foot dangling over the side of the bed like always. Steve was relieved. There had been no intruder, but he was also worried and confused. He propped the softball bat up against the wall and climbed back into the bed. What are you doing? 
In his anxious state, his wife's voice made him nearly jump out of his skin. He, d he took a deep breath, tried to calm down. Didn't you hear the noise in the living room? No, I didn't hear anything, Victoria said. And you know what a light sleeper I am. If there had been noise, I definitely would have heard it. Maybe you were dreaming. No, it was real. When I went into the living room, Abigail was standing there. She looked blank and weird and was bumping into the furniture. Victoria gave him a patient smile. Sweetheart, do you remember that the children sleepwalk sometimes? They get it from you. You'll be dreaming wild stuff, saying absurd things and wandering all over the house. I even caught you wandering around in the yard one night. With you, it's sleepwalking the, with night terrors. Fortunately, the kids just seem to have gotten the sleepwalking part. No, Steve said. I don't remember any of that. It was so upsetting to not be able to piece his recent past together. To not even remember basic facts about himself and his kids. Well, now you know, so there's no need to worry. Victoria smiled and patted the empty spot beside her. Come back to bed. Steve couldn't sleep. He always had that same sensation of someone or something inside the house wishing to do him and his family harm. And always Victoria comforted him, reminding him about his history of sleepwalking and night terrors. Often Steve marvelled at what an amazing wife she was, always so kind and patient and caring. He figured it couldn't be easy to be married to someone like him who was such a mess all the time. Mess or not, he was really pouring himself into making the first Fazbear Entertainment game. Since the company agreed to let Steve work at home, he had turned the house's tiny attic into his office. He called his da daily climbing off the ladder, his commute to work. It was nice to hear Victoria and the children talking and playing beneath him when he was working and to know that at lunchtime all he had to do was climb down the ladder to join them. He was still haunted by the nighttime visions and fears, but during the day he channeled all those feelings into the game he was creating. Those feelings of being unsafe all ended up on the screen in front of him. If Fazbear Entertainment wanted a scary game, then a scary game was what they were going to have. When Steve climbed down the ladder for lunch, Abigail said, Surprise, Daddy! We're having a picnic! A voice on the radio that Victoria kept on during the day said, Heavy thunder showers expected over the next 24 hours. Take shelter if possible, folks. Lightning is dangerous. It doesn't sound like picnic weather, Steve said. Victoria, who was carrying a pitcher of lemonade, laughed. I thought we'd have a picnic indoors, like our first date. The picnic was nice. Victoria spread a blanket on the floor, and they ate chicken salad sandwiches and grapes and drank lemonade. After they ate, Abigail said, Daddy, let's play hide and seek. Hide, seek, Avery yelled. Steve knew if he played with them a while, he might tire them out so they would take a nap and give their mum a break. Sure, he said. I can play a few rounds before I have to get back to work. The kids jumped up and down in a frenzy of delight. Steve felt his heart fill with love. They were such adorable, amazing kids. He wished he could remember every minute he had spent with them. Steve covered his eyes and started counting out loud very slowly. One, two, three. When he reached twenty, he opened his eyes and began his search. Abigail was old enough to be a pretty good hider, but Avery could always be found in plain sight. Right now he was standing behind a floor lamp. Steve, like always, looked around as though he couldn't see his son, then finally moved closer to the lamp. Where's Avery? Where's Avery? Steve asked loudly and theatrically. He called to Victoria. Sweetheart, have you seen Avery? No, honey, I have no idea where she could be. She called back. Victoria knew her part of the game as well. I sure do wish I could find him, Steve said. Behind the floor lamp, Avery giggled. Steve kept up the ruse of not being able to find Avery until Avery's giggling grew more and more out of control. He finally jumped up and said, Daddy, I'm here! Steve put his hand on his chest and jumped backward as if startled. There you are, you got me, you're such a good hider. I got you, Avery said, still overcome with hilar hilarity. Now I just need to find your sister, Steve said. 
He wandered around the house and didn't hear and didn't see her anywhere. He felt a prickle of anxiety. He knew she was nearby and safe and just playing, but something about her invisibility triggered a primal parental fear. He thought of parents whose children would go missing for real, who spend months or years trying to find them. He thought of missing persons reports and kids' faces on, ki on milk cartons. He suddenly wanted to find a Abigail very badly, to see her beautiful little face. The bedroom closet. She had hidden there before. He went into the bedroom but hesitated before opening the closet door. Something inside him didn't want to open it, maybe because it made him think of his night terrors, of the sounds in the house that he investigated with a feeling of dread, not wanting to know what was, what was causing them, but needing to know. BOO! The closet door swung open and Abigail jumped out. Steve cried out for real and jumped backward, his heart pounded in his chest. This is reminding me, I, I'm not going to say too much, but this is reminding me a little bit of kind of FNAF 4. You know, Foxy in the closet, jump scare. Yeah, anyway, wow, you really got me, he said once he had recovered enough to talk. Silly daddy, it was just me, Abigail said. Did you think it was a ghost? Yeah, I kind of did, Steve said. You're right, daddy is very, very silly. Even in the daylight, even when playing with his kids, the fear was creeping in. He was afraid of noises, sudden movements, even of his own little girl jumping out at him. He went back inside, climbed the ladder, and started back in on the game. It was easy for Steve to create jump scares because he'd just been on the receiving end of one himself. He knew the startled feeling, the cry of shock, the accelerated heartbeat, and then that wash of relief when you realise that it's just a game and you're really safe. Well, he knew all those things, except for the relief. Lately, he never felt like he was safe. Steve sat in front of the TV, staring at a late night talk show without really watching it. Victoria stood in the doorway in her bathrobe and pyjamas. Honey, are you coming to bed? Sure, Steve said, raising the remote to click off the TV. I thought I might make myself some warm milk first, though, you know, to try to relax. You definitely need to relax, Victoria said. Have some milk, and then maybe I'll give you a shoulder, mas shoulder massage. That would be nice, Steve said absently. Procrastinating going to bed had become a habit with him. It made sense, really. The less time he spent sleeping, the fewer nightmares he'd have. He drank his warm milk and let Victoria knead his shoulders. Both of these things seemed relaxing at the time he was doing them, but as soon as his head hit the pillow, his body felt like one big ball of tension. It was worse than that. It was terror. He lay there, his eyes wide open, fighting sleep. Then he heard it. The whirring. The rumbling. They were inside the walls. And this wasn't a nightmare because he knew he had never fallen asleep. Whatever it was that was after him was inside the walls scurrying, scratching, and looking for a way out. He felt a sudden need to flee the bedroom, but when he stood in the doorway, he heard more rustling and rattling coming from the living room. So they were there, too. He backed up and tried to close the bedroom door, but it was useless. There was no way to lock yourself in and keep intruders out. No one was safe. Steve and his family were sitting ducks, all of them. A loud bump came from the bedroom wall on Steve's left, he turned to look at it. The surface of the wall began to pulse and throb, forming a large bubble on the surface that reminded Steve of the way cheese bubbles up on a pizza. Then, with a wet splat, the bubble popped like a zit, and an oily black substance splattered across the room. Steve needed to get out of there. He needed to get Victoria out of there. How could she be sleeping through this? He ran over to her side of the bed and shook her shoulder. Victoria, wake up! What is it? Are the kids okay? Victoria sat up, rubbing her eyes. Unable to find words, Steve pointed at the wall, which now had a gaping hole out of which the black slime oozed. What? Victoria said. Why do you want me to look at the wall? Don't you see it? Steve said. The black slime was dripping from the hole onto the floor. Victoria took his hand. Honey, you're having a nightmare. Lie back down. I'm not having a nightmare because I'm not asleep, Steve yelled. He never raised his voice to his wife or her kids, but he was freaking out. I know it feels that way because you're walking and talking, Victoria said. 
but if you lie down and close your eyes, it'll all go away. Desperate to escape his terror, Steve let himself be coaxed into lying back down. He closed his eyes, feeling how tired he was, how much his body longed for rest. But the noises in the walls didn't stop. There would be no sleep for him tonight. This is DJ Dan the Music Man, the voice on the radio said. We've got heavy snow coming on right now. No time to go out and buy milk and bread. Just stay at home and stay safe. <laughs> DJ Dan the Music Man, that's so good. Abigail looked out the window and announced, He's right, it's snowing. By morning, the yard and surrounding woods were covered in a heavy blanket of snow. The grass and trees looked like they'd been covered in a thick layer of white cake frosting. At first it was fun. They played board games, made popcorn and drank hot chocolate. It all felt very cosy. The trouble was the snow didn't stop. It kept falling, wet and heavy, and the temperature plummeted, so it was too frigid for anyone to stay outside for long. Beneath the snow, the roads were a solid sheet of ice. As a result, they were trapped in the house, which was the last place Steve wanted to be. Because they were there. They were always there, even though he only heard them at night. Sometimes, though he would never say it to Victoria because he knew how delusional it sounded, it felt like they had, ha had made the snow happen because it put Steve there in the house, right where they wanted him. The ringing was getting worse too. The high-pitched sound was always in his head, day and night. Just like the house, he couldn't escape it. It was day five of the blizzard and the snowfall was still heavy. Steve, Victoria and the kids were sitting around the dinner table eating macaroni and cheese and canned green beans Victoria had tried to jazz up with salt, butter and dill. I know this morning... I, sorry. I know this meal isn't up to my usual standards of cooking, Victoria said, but I'm having to dig through the pantry for food since we can't get out to the grocery store. I could eat mac and cheese every day, Abigail said. One of the two kids, she was the pickier eater. Uh, of the two kids, she was the pickier eater. I'm sure you could, Victoria said, but I bet your daddy would rather have a steak and some salad. Actually, I'm kind of digging the mac and cheese, Steve said. It was comfort food, and he certainly needed comfort. More than mere food could provide. Say, when was the last time you checked the weather? Not since this morning, Victoria said. Unless you count uh, looking out the window. Just what we needed, the DJ said in his fake shipper voice. I don't know what this is supposed to mean, but I'm doing the, this voice because I really like doing this voice. <laughs> had, somebody, had somebody turned on the radio? More snow! The National Weather Service is calling for at least three more inches tomorrow with a high of 15 degrees. It's gonna be up to our eyeballs, people. This is DJ Dan, the music man, staying safe. Say, ah, oh, damn it. Saying stay home and stay safe. Victoria got up and switched off the radio. You know, I've lived in this area all my life, and I've never seen snow like this, Steve said. Back when he was at school, they went whole winters without having any snow days. I know, it's like we're at the North Pole, Vi Victoria said. Then where's Santa? Abigail said. Victoria laughed. That's an excellent question. If we're stuck in the house, then we deserve presents. Christmas in February! Abigail's innocent question made Steve want to cry. Where was Santa indeed? Santa was a symbol of hope, and Steve had lost all hope. Haunted, hunted, trapped and not only trapped, but trapped in a dangerous place. Victoria and the kids seemed to think they were safe in the house, but Steve knew better. He stood up from the table. I think I'm going to work for a couple more hours. Are you sure? Victoria said. You've been working all day, and I promised the kids would watch a movie together. You guys go ahead and get the movie started. I'll be down in a bit. Steve knew he was too distracted, too much of a mess to focus on a movie. Right now the only thing he seemed to be able to focus on was work. He had already completed the first game, so that one was down. Once he submitted all four games, he'd get a big payout from Fazbear Entertainment. Their financial worries would be over, and they could move somewhere else. Somewhere safe, where they could be happy together. Nightmare fuel. He had heard that phrase used to describe a variety of scary images, creepy clowns and dolls especially. But what Steve was doing was using his nightmares as fuel to power his games the strange noises and sights, the ongoing feeling of being watched and tracked. 
he poured all of it into the game. And somehow when he was working, he could almost convince himself that he had control over the forces that terrified him at night. Almost, but not quite. He knew he was spinning out of control, and sometimes he was afraid he had spun so far out, he would never find his way back again. Steve fell into the game, uh, sorry, Steve fell into game two and lost track of time. Once he climbed down the ladder, the house was silent. Victoria and the kids were all in bed. Steve decided a hot shower might soothe him, put him in a position to get some sleep. He struggled to remember the last time he had gotten a real night of sleep. Steve regarded himself in the bathroom mirror. He looked awful. His face was greyish and stubbly. His eyes were bloodshot with dark pouches beneath them. But what scared him most was not the signs of exhaustion, but the wildness in his eyes, as if he were a trapped animal. Who was he kidding? He was a trapped animal. As he took off his shirt, he felt a small pain in his right forearm. He looked at it and saw a small, shallow cut, the kind of cut one might get from, shaving, from a shaving accident. But that made no sense, since he didn't shave his forearms. Examining himself further, he found several small cuts and abrasions on both arms and his chest and belly. He racked his brain, trying to figure out where these injuries could have come from. It wasn't like he had a dangerous job. It was pretty hard to hurt yourself sitting in front of a computer all day. The kids had begged him to play Tickle Monster after lunch, and he had obliged, but it wasn't like the kids carried or wore anything sharp or dangerous. Of course, deep down he knew that the kids weren't the source of his injuries. The source of his wounds was the same as the source of the high-pitched ringing that was inside his head day and night. But as annoying as the ringing was, the cuts and scrapes were worse. They meant that it wasn't just that something wanted to hurt him, something was hurting him. Steve stepped into the steaming shower, the hot water stung his cuts and abrasions. If there was an upside to his wounds, it was that they were physical evidence that he wasn't just having night terrors, as Victoria kept insisting. The objects of his terror were real. Sleep was not an option, so after his shower, Steve sat on the living room couch, not watching TV, not reading, just sitting and waiting for the intruders to make their presence known. For a while, there was nothing. Then, he saw the glow of light that came on when someone opened the refrigerator door in the kitchen. There was the slamming of the kitchen cabinet doors. He got up and ran to the kitchen, ready to face whoever or whatever was making the noise. Avery was standing beside the kitchen sink. Why did the sight of his own son in the kitchen, in the dark kitchen, make him uneasy? Why aren't you in bed, buddy? Steve asked. He could hear a nervous quaver in his own voice. Hi, Daddy. I'm thirsty, Avery said. Here, I'll get you a glass of water, but then you have to go back to bed. Okay, Daddy. Steve's hand shook as he held the glass under the faucet. Avery took the glass and sipped it, uh, and sipped from it once then set it down and toddled back toward his room. Maybe Steve was having some kind of mental breakdown. The noises he had heard in the kitchen couldn't possibly have been made by a two-year-old child, though, could they? Hmm, maybe none of the sounds he was hearing were real, but the cuts and scrapes were real, weren't they? He went back into the living room and sank to the couch. Outside, the snow made everything silent, and inside, everyone but him seemed to be soundly asleep. It would have been peaceful if he hadn't been so terrified. Then the noise started, a scrambling and skittering inside the living room walls. Steve put his hands over his ears. Stop it, stop it, he begged, rocking back and forth in some primal attempt to comfort himself. The walls around him pulsated. A hole appeared in the wall nearest him like a fist had punched through it. But what Steve saw emerging from the hole was not a fist. It was the head, the head of something. It was small, but bulbous and veined, its large eyes almond-shaped with cat-like pupils. It lunged forward from the hole in the wall and parted its jaws to reveal a mouthful of sharp-looking teeth. Its pointed tongue darted out like a snake's when it sniffed the air. Steve was paralysed with fear. The only part of him that felt like it was moving was his heart hammering in his chest. The creature's tongue shot further out, impossibly far, it seemed, and pierced the skin of, Steam's, of Steve's forearm like the hypodermic needle. The pain was intense. Had the thing poisoned him? He looked at his arm, and he saw a small red puncture wound with a bruise already forming around it. 
Holding his injured arm, he ran from the living room down the hall. The walls in the hallway pulsed too, and another hole appeared. A green serpent-like head poked out of the hole, its scales a metallic green. It opened its mouth and puked up a large tangle of snakes. The snakes landed on the floor, undulated out of their knot, and slithered around Steve's feet. Steve hated snakes. He lifted his feet out of the snake pile and ran to the bedroom. Since the door didn't close or lock properly, he propped a chair up against it. Victoria sat up in bed. Steve, what in the world? Steve was panting. It was hard to find words. They're coming out of the walls. Some kind of monsters or aliens or something. And snakes. The hall is full of snakes. He knew how crazy he sounded, but he also knew what he had seen. Sit down, Victoria said. Take deep breaths. Steve's breathing was fast and shallow. He sat on the bed and tried to slow things down. Do you want me to look out in the hall? Victoria asked. No! Steve yelled louder than he'd meant to. The snakes! The snakes will get in! I think we're okay with the door closed. I don't think they can get underneath it. His wife looked at him with a mixture of fear and pity. I think the stress of developing these games is getting to you, sweetheart. That and the financial pressure and the fact that we've not been able to leave the house for so long. But I promise you, honey, there can't be snakes in the hallway. It's winter time. The snakes are hibernating. The ones in our hallway aren't, Steve said. They're wide awake. Look, I understand that you don't think any of this is real. He started unbuttoning his pyjama top. But look at these. You can't tell me that these aren't real. He held out his, ha his scratched, cut and punctured bare arms. Oh, my poor darling, Victoria said, unshed tears sparkling in her eyes. Just a second, I'll be right back. She disappeared into the bathroom and returned with a tube of antibiotic ointment. She sat next to him on the bed and started dabbing the medicine on his cuts and scrapes. As soon as the snow melts, we're going to get you some help. He knew she didn't mean regular medical help. She meant psychiatric help. She didn't believe him. She was the one person whose trust he counted on, and she didn't believe him. Steve put his head in his hands. He had lived a lonely life before Victoria and the kids, but somehow he had never felt more alone than he did right now. Lie down, Victoria said, gently pushing him back on the bed. You need to rest. Steve lay down, but he did not rest. Even though the house was quiet now, the high-pitched ringing in his head was deafening. What a great section of the story. <laughs> that is amazing. This is terrifying, by the way. <laughs> the snakes, oh my gosh. Okay. In the morning, Steve, head still ringing, opened the bedroom door with a great deal of trepidation, expecting to see the floor squirming with snakes. But the floor looked completely normal, and there was no hole in the wall in the spot where Steve remembered the serpent-like creature poking out its head. Maybe Victoria was right. Maybe he did need help. The smells of coffee and bacon were wafting from the kitchen, and Steve was surprised to find the aromas pleasant, despite his damaged emotional state. Besides, he had to eat to keep up his strength. He had to, fi he had to work to finish the games. If he finished the games, then he'd have the money to leave if the snowstorm ever stopped. Victoria was standing at the stove in her bathrobe, simultaneously scrambling eggs and tending to a pan of sizzling bacon. The kids were already at the table with their glasses of orange juice. They were always in such a good mood in the morning. Victoria smiled at him as if everything was normal. Get us some coffee, why don't you? She said. The radio was on, as it always seemed to be these days, so they could keep track of the weather. After a disconcertingly happy-sounding pop song finished playing, the DJ said, DJ Dan, the music man here, and I've got good news and bad news, folks. The good news is that the chance of precipitation today is just 30%, but the bad news is that the temperature won't get above 30 degrees. We might not get any more snow, but the snow we do have isn't going anywhere. So stay inside and stay safe, and I'll keep spinning tunes to help you happy. So, oh God, to help you happy? To keep you happy. And now, by special request, here's the latest hit from Sailor Thrift. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes! <laughs> <coughs> oh, doing that voice makes my throat go so sore. We got a Taylor Swift parody? What? <laughs> um, Steve's hand shook as he lifted the pot and poured the coffee into cups. 
He put milk in Victoria's coffee the way she liked it and sat down with the kids. He tried to act normal, but he knew he was failing. What's wrong, Daddy? Abigail asked. There you had it. He couldn't act normal enough to fool a four-year-old. Nothing, honey, he said. I'm just tired. I didn't sleep very well last night. Why? Avery asked. He was getting into the why stage. Because there are monsters in the walls, Steve thought. But there was no way he was going to say that to a two-year-old. Instead, he said, I don't know, buddy. Sometimes I just can't sleep. He ate the bacon and eggs and toast mechanically, the same way he put gas into his car. He needed the fuel to keep going, to do what he had to do, which was finish the games. As soon as he shallow uh, shallowed? As soon as he swallowed the last mouthful of food, he chugged the remains of his coffee and got up to go climb the ladder to work. When he first started working on the games, climbing the ladder into the attic had felt like he was entering the, the darkness. The horrific world he was creating on the screen as he sat in the windowless attic was a stark contrast to the happiness and light radiated by his wife and children in the rest of the house. But now the darkness was spilling over into everything. The only time the high-pitched ringing in his head stopped was when he was working on the game. Or maybe it didn't stop, but the game was the only thing that distracted him from the sound. The hours fell away as Steve worked. He was on game number three now. When Victoria called up at him that it was time for lunch, he had been so immersed that he jumped and gasped as he thought, uh, as, as though he had been started by a monster instead of his wife. Sorry. Not hungry, he called back. Going to work until dinner time. Okay, Victoria replied. Let me know if you need anything. He didn't answer because he had already fallen back into the game. Victoria had made spaghetti for dinner again with garlic bread. Abigail and Avery, their mouths and chins dark orange with sauce, slurped the long noodles and giggled. Victoria was always kind and supportive, and her cooking was always delicious, even now that she was limited to their pantry ingredients because they'd been snowed in for so long. The children were great too. Great? The children were great too. Starting to g gain a lisp while reading this. Um, they were charming and cheerful, and never fought like Steve had with his siblings when he was a kid. Steve knew he could have a perfect life with them if they could just get away from this place, this snowbound house of horrors that quite possibly was driving him insane. But he had the power to get them out, he reminded himself. He was over halfway finished with the game. You're quiet tonight, Victoria said. Sorry, Steve twirled some spaghetti around his fork. I'm just having a hard time getting my head out of the game. Is it going well? she asked, reaching over to dab at Avery's orange face with a napkin. Steve nodded. No matter how unstable and terrified he was in his regular life, somehow his work on the games was really, really good. Can we play them when, we're, when they're ready? Abigail asked. You can play them when you're a little older, Steve said. Right now, they're too scary for you. Sometimes I feel like they're too scary for me, too. Abigail and Avery giggled. To them, the idea of a grown-up being scared was so unimaginable that it was funny. After the kids had bathed and gone to bed, Victoria and Steve cuddled on the couch with the radio playing softly in the background. Even with the volumes lowered, uh, even with the volume lowered, Steve could hear DJ Dan's familiar voice saying, "Even more snow tonight, folks. It looks like we're going to have a white Valentine's Day. If we keep up at this rate, we might have a white St. Patrick's Day too." Because he was stuck in the house all the time, the dates tended to run together. Steve had forgotten that the next day was Valentine's Day. I'm so sorry that I've not been able to get you anything for Valentine's Day, Steve said as he stroked, uh, as he stroked Victoria's lustrous hair. Victoria laughed. There's no need to apologise. You can't go shopping for cards when you can't get out of the house. The kids are going to make cards out of construction paper tomorrow. Maybe you can make me one too. Just be neater with the glitter than they are. Cleaning up that stuff is a nightmare. You deserve more than a card, Steve said swept up, as he often was, by Victoria's sheer wonderfulness. It was rare for a person to be equally beautiful on the outside and the inside, but she was. You deserve red roses and chocolates and a nice piece of jewellery. Shh, Victoria said, putting her index finger gently against his lips. You're the only Valentine's pre Day present I need. <coughs> oh, it's gross. <laughs> I have no idea how I got so lucky, Steve said. Victoria smiled. I feel the same way. The radio was playing a song that Steve had already heard twice that day.
by Taylor Swift. Uh, Sailor Thrift. No, I'm joking. That was always the problem with Top 40 Radio. They played the same songs over and over. And to be honest, he was getting a little sick of DJ Dan too. Didn't that station have any other DJs? <laughs> DJ Dan seemed to work all hours of the night and day. I love how this is like a main plot point now. It's so funny. Steve stood up and walked over to the window where the radio sat on the sill. Hey, if you don't mind, I'm going to change the station. Oh, d don't do that, said Victoria. Her tone sounded casual on the surface, but there was tension underneath. Why not? Steve said. He was already fiddling with the knob. I'm in the mood for some classic rock, and I'm sure any station we listen to will have updates on the weather. But he couldn't seem to find another station. When he turned it away from the usual pop station, there wasn't even static, only silence. Huh, that's weird. That's what I was trying to tell you, Victoria said. It's hard to get a signal out here in the country. For some reason, that pop station's the only one we can re get reliably. We really are in the middle of nowhere, aren't we? Steve said, giving up and turning back to the pop station. No cell phone service? One radio station? Yeah, Victoria said. But I like it. It's peaceful. Steve had felt anything but peaceful lately. But don't you ever feel trapped? Especially right now when we've been snowed in so long. Victoria smiled. Well, I'd be lying if I said I wouldn't like to be able to go out to the store and maybe grab a pizza somewhere. But overall, I think being snowed in with you and the kids is cosy. Steve couldn't believe he'd gotten so lucky. Why would a woman like Victoria even give him the time of day? Well, there's no one I'd rather be snowed in with than you. They kissed. And Victoria said, I think I'm going on to bed. How about you? Steve's stomach became a knot of tension at the thought of lying awake in bed and listening to the noises, waiting to see if something burst out of the walls. Waiting to see if the monsters just wanted to scare him, or do him lasting, maybe lethal harm. I'll be along in a bit, he said. Well, don't stay up all night, Victoria said, getting up from the couch. Sleep deprivation isn't good for your health, physical or mental. I know, Steve said. He was shaky, exhausted, and in a dead panic most of the time. He didn't need to be told his physical and mental health was suffering. Believe me, I know. I promise I'll try to get some sleep tonight. Once Victoria was gone, it was like he had lost his safety net and was being plunged into darkness. There was a scraping sound in the walls, like something with sharp claws was inside them. The ringing in his head became so loud it drowned out the music on the radio. He couldn't sit here and be alone. It was so, so much worse when he was alone. The only time he could bear to be alone was when he was working on the game. He was on the last game now. He just had to see it through. He should go to bed, even though he knew he couldn't sleep. At least Victoria would be there beside him. <clears throat> Here we go. This is the good bit. As he walked down the hall, the walls pulsated, and the ceiling buckled so it looked like the underside of a hammock. The lowest part of the ceiling cracked, then opened wider, and from the hole emerged a spider the size of a basketball, which dangled just above him from a tendril of web. It was black and hairy, fanged and many-eyed. Beside its fangs were pincers, which it rubbed together menacingly. Steve stood still, afraid to move or even breathe. How could a spider be so big? Was it venomous? If it was, it was probably packing enough venom to kill a herd of elephants. And then the huge spider's abdomen split open. Out of the opening fell hundreds, maybe thousands, of small spiders like candy falling from a piñata. Steve was covered in spiders. They were in his hair, on his face, and on his hands and arms. They were crawling into his ears, his nose, and his mouth. He screamed and slapped at them with both hands, slapped himself all over, over and over again, in hopes of squishing them. Victoria came running. What is it? Steve didn't want to talk, because he didn't want more spiders to crawl in his mouth. But he managed to say through clenched teeth, Spiders! They're all over me! Victoria looked confused and a little alarmed. She took Steve's arm. No! Don't touch me! They're good on you too! Victoria drew her hands back in a gesture of surrender. Okay, but come with me. I need to see you in the light. Still slapping himself all over, Steve followed her into the bedroom. She looked him up and down. Honey, I don't know how to tell you this because I know it's real to you. But I don't see any spiders. 
But how can you not? They're all over... Steve looked down at his arms, his hands, his shirt. The spiders were gone. He sat down on the edge of his bed. They were here. They were here. The ringing sound in his head was getting louder and louder, like an ambulance announcing the presence of an emergency. This place... It's making me crazy, he said, on the verge of tears. He stood up. I have to get out of here. I have to get out of here for a while, even if it's just going for a walk in the snow. No, Victoria said. It's too cold out there, and the snow's too deep. It's not safe. But Steve was already halfway down the hall. The ringing in his head was, glo was growing unbearably loud, like a smoke detector designed to wake up everybody in a burning house. A smoke detector? That was exactly what it sounded like. Steve looked at the smoke detector mounted on the ceiling in the living room. Something inside him said, If you disable the smoke alarm, the sound will stop. As the ringing in his head continued, he grabbed a poker from the fireplace and hit the smoke alarm with it until he knocked it down onto the floor. He continued beating it with the poker, then jumped up and down on it several times for good measure until it was smashed into pieces. At first, there was silence silence and relief. But then Steve became aware that although it was finally silent in his head, he was still surrounded by noise. There was the din of the ever-present DJ Dan on the radio prattling on about the never-ending snowstorm. But there was another sound too. It was different than what he was used to hearing in the house though. It wasn't scraping or scuttling but a variety of mechanical sounds. Wheels turning, gears grinding. It sounded like he was on the production floor of a small factory. The sounds weren't the only things that were different. The house looked different too. The furniture was the same, but there were strange tread marks on the floor. Hinged trapdoors were on the walls and ceiling in the exact places where the creatures had jumped out at him. It was like being inside an, an amusement park's at an amusement park's haunted house with the lights turned on. He heard more whirring, but whatever was making it was moving toward him from the hallway. He looked around for a hiding place, and finally ducked into the coat closet. He tried to pull the closet door shut, but like every other door in this in infernal house, it wouldn't close all the way. He ducked behind the hangers of coats and jackets, his heart pounding. Honey, where are you? Victoria's voice called. You didn't go for a walk in the snow, did you? Her voice was coming from the living room, but he couldn't hear her footsteps, only a motorised whirring sound. Steve peeked out from behind the coats, or from between the coats. Standing in the living room was a robot! <laughs> it was all steel, with visible wires and circuits. The only part of it that faintly resembled a human being was its face a mask of plastic with feminine features. Steve? Victoria's voice was coming from inside the robot. Steve, I know you must still be here because your snow boots are, in, are beside the door. Where are you, sweetheart? Steve's first thought when seeing the robot was, what have you done to Victoria and why do you have her voice? But it didn't take long for reality to set in. The robot hadn't done anything to Victoria. The robot was Victoria. Or at least it was what he had been calling Victoria for the past few weeks, or months, or however long he'd been trapped here. Steve felt like he might be sick, but he couldn't let himself throw up. If he threw up, he would make a sound, which would ruin his hiding place. He thought of the games of hide-and-seek he had played with the children, full of fun and laughter, so different from the hiding he was doing now. Wait children. The children are in danger from this terrifying thing they thought they were, was their mother. I have to save them. Mummy, where's Daddy? Abigail's voice called. Daddy, Daddy! Avery called. Steve peeked out again from between the coats. What he saw made him shiver, as though the temperature in the room had just dropped 40 degrees. The children were robots too. Smaller ones, but also with plastic mask faces, with wide robotic eyes and exposed mechanical parts. They moved jerkily around the room, looking behind curtains and under tables, calling, Daddy! Daddy! When Steve didn't respond, 
the robots stopped using their human voices and began to search more aggressively, with only the soundtrack of whirring machinery and the pop radio station in the background. The three robots picked up furniture like it was nothing heavier than a pile of sticks. They opened and looked inside the trapdoors, even though the spaces were much too small for him to hide in. It was only a matter of time until one of them looked inside the coat closet. What would they do when they found him? Steve feared for his life. The pop song on the radio ended, and DJ Dan said, Stay in and stay safe. Well, everybody except you, Steve. Steve shook his head, as if to jar his brain awake. This was impossible. None of it could be happening. Steve, buddy, you need to come out, the familiar voice from the radio said. Your family is looking for you. Playtime's over, Steve. Victoria, Abigail, Avery, they're all getting worried about you. You don't want to worry your beautiful wife and children, do you? Through the coats, he watched the animatronic trio go into the kitchen. He knew he couldn't stay in the, clo in the coat closet forever. If he made it to the bedroom, he could get his car keys. He didn't know how well he'd be able to drive in such deep snow, but it was his only shot, so he at least had to try. He ducked out of the coat closet and ran down the hall toward the bedroom, but then he heard the whirring of machinery again and knew they were in the living room. He darted into the bathroom, stepped into the tub and pulled the shower curtain in front of him. He was out of breath from exertion and terror. Steve! Steve, honey! It was Victoria's voice coming from the hall. Then he heard the sound of her metal feet on the bathroom tile. The steps grew closer and closer. In one great sweeping motion, his robot wife ripped the shower curtain from the rings holding it in place. Steve was exposed, a sitting duck. He looked at the blank plastic face that was looking at him, and then, with more strength than he knew he possessed, he put both his hands against the robot's cold, mechanical shoulders and shoved it as hard as he could. The force threw the robot off balance, making it fall forward. Steve leaped from the tub, ran past the robot that was already working on writing itself, and made it to the bedroom, shutting the door behind him. Everything the door didn't really shut. Uh, sorry, what? I, I don't know why I said everything there. Ow, my feet hurt. Uh, except the door didn't really shut. And in the hall, he could hear the once sweet sounding, now terrifying voices of his children calling, Daddy! Daddy! <laughs> Steve leaned against the door with all his weight. He grabbed the wooden chair from the vanity and angled its back under the doorknob in hopes of making the door harder to open. But the door was the only way out of the room. How long could he hold out? The three robots were on the other side of the door pushing. He was holding them off for now. But he knew he would get tired. They wouldn't. Steve. Wait. Yeah, okay. Uh, Steve. Listen up, Steve. Steve turned his head in the direction of the adult male voice to see the, ro uh, the radio that had been in the living room now sitting on the nightstand beside the bed. Had Victoria moved it there in anticipation of Steve ending up in the bedroom? Steve, this is your buddy DJ Dan the Music Man. The voice from the radio continued. I'm here to help you, Steve. You're not going to be able to keep holding that door, buddy. Your arms are already tired, aren't they? Steve could feel the muscles in his arms quiver and weaken. He wasn't a spend hours at the gym kind of guy. He was a sit hours at the computer guy. He knew his strength was no match for the robot's steel. Still, he tried to hold on. Steve, the voice on the radio continued. Do you remember when you lived alone in your sad little apartment, working for minimum wage, trying unsuccessfully to try and get a, uh, to get a game off of the ground? Do you remember when dinner was a microwaved burrito you ate alone, and how sometimes you'd be so lonely you'd go to the bodega and buy something random just so you could make chit chat with the cashier? I remember, Steve said. How mu How did the guy on the radio know so much about him? And why was the guy on the radio talking to him personally anyway? Was all this stuff real? Or had he finally reached his breaking point? And now, think about how happy you've been since you came here, DJ Dan said in his soothing voice. No one has ever had a nicer, more beautiful wife than Victoria. And your adorable kids. You always wanted to be a dad, and it's great, isn't it? But it's not real, Steve said. His whole body was pressed against the door. 
but the robots were standing their ground, pushing it from the other side. Sure it is, buddy. Everything you felt for your wife and kids. It was as real as it gets. You just have to give yourself permission to be happy. But the night terrors, the things in the house, those weren't real. Those were just there to inspire you while you worked on the game. Say the word, and they're gone. Let go of the door, Steve, and I promise what's on the other side won't come in. You need to stop fighting this, and let yourself be happy. There were tears in, Steve, in Steve's eyes. He had to admit that the moments of joy he had experienced with Victoria and the kids were greater than any other happiness he had ever known. But the moments of terror he had experienced in this house were unsurpassed too. Everything there, uh, oh sorry, everything here, had been so much more intense than anything that had come before. He felt like all the most important moments in his life had happened here, and yet he had been in this house only a few weeks. And how do I let myself be happy? He asked. His voice sounded small, weak. It's as easy as pushing a button, DJ Dan's voice said. If you let go of the door and walk over to the radio, you'll see a red button on its side. If you push that button, you'll have everything you've ever dreamed of. The perfect woman you always wanted. The perfect children you always wanted. And guess what? No more pushing mops or scrubbing toilets for you, buddy, because you'll be one of the world's most successful video game developers. That's a lot of happiness for pushing one little button. Steve found himself holding the door less forcefully. But it's not real, he said, even though he felt his resistance weakening. Reality is what we make it, Steve, DJ Dan said. Make your own reality and make it beautiful. All you have to do is push the button. Steve thought back to his days of mop pushing and frustration and loneliness. He let go of the door, turned his back on it, and faced the radio. You can do it, Steve! DJ Dan's voice urged him. You can live a life of bliss. Isn't that a beautiful word? Bliss. Steve moved closer to the radio. He heard a creak as the bedroom door opened behind him. There was the red button. All he had to do was push, and the fantasy would become reality. It was such a beautiful fantasy, and what favours had reality ever done for him? Steve's hand shook as he reached out toward the radio. He pushed the button. The high-pitched ringing filled Steve's head, filled the room, and seemed to fill the whole world. Steve clapped his hands over his ears, but, did, but it did nothing to muffle the horrible cacophony. He fell to his knees as the room started to spin, and then, just as suddenly, everything was still. Steve used the nightstand to steady himself as he rose to his feet. He looked around the bedroom. Everything looked normal. And then he saw her. Victoria was standing in the doorway. Her blue-black hair was like a halo around her lovely face. She was wearing the same green dress she wore the first time they met. His favourite dress. He could say she was just as beautiful as the day they met. But that would be a lie. She was even more beautiful. Victoria. He breathed her name in a reverent whisper. Sweetheart, she said, looking at him with love in her green-flecked brown eyes. She opened her arms to him. This time, Steve didn't hesitate. He went to her. He wrapped his arms around her and pressed his lips to hers. Bliss. That was the perfect word for what he was feeling. His bliss was so great that he barely felt the continuous stabbing in the vicinity of his heart. Oh my god! <laughs> this story is the best story, in my opinion. It's so good! Oh my god, I had chills so many times during that story! I also think I did a pretty good job of reading that, to be honest. That's probably one of my best audiobooks that I've done. Um, wow, what do I even say about this? This story is probably my favourite story right now. I'm just going to put it out there. I think it's my favourite story. Let me just have a drink of water before I say my final thoughts. Thank you for, um, for listening for this long. Uh, listening through with me. Or reading through with me, whatever. Um, 
This story is amazing. Let me just tell you some kind of thoughts that I have about this story, uh, and then we'll end. Basically, um, I feel like I don't know. I don't know where to start. I honestly don't know where to start. I think that everything about the story is wonderful. It is amazingly done. Now, in terms of theorizable content, there isn't too much, except the fact that um, you know, illusion discs in the smoke detector, I would say, and of course, he is the rogue indie developer, or supposedly he is a rogue indie developer for the FNAF VR type games, right? So, I believe that he was responsible for, in FNAF VR, he was responsible for FNAF 1, FNAF 2, FNAF 3, and Night Terrors. That makes a lot of sense, right? Because Night Terrors is what FNAF 4 is called. But the thing is, in this story, he never actually completed the fourth game. He died before completing his fourth. So, I have a feeling that that's kind of like Night Terrors is referring to that. And there were a lot of like FNAF 4 parallels, as I was saying throughout the story. There was like hiding in the cut in the cut. Well, that's that's it, honestly. Hiding in the cupboard. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, that is it. <laughs> but um, that is amazing. Such a good story. Obviously, it doesn't have anything to do with the pizza plex, except DJ Dan the Music Man, who is an amazing character. But I don't care if it has anything to do with the pizza plex or not. This story is straight up S tier. You cannot tell me otherwise. Guys, let me know if you would put it in the S tier as well. I think this is amazing. What do you think? Thank you so much for listening. And uh, I will see you in our next audiobook reading, hopefully, which is Haps, which is also quite a good one. So stay tuned for that. See you later.